I am going to make uh, a small presentation and we can start. Mm -hmm. Okay, Mohamed is a big data astronomer of the Instituto de Astrofísica de Canarias and he's founder of an architecture to aid in the reproducibility of scientific results. That perhaps, as you know, is a very important topic in the scientific community just now because some, sometimes the, the scientific results or the, the scientific findings are not reproduci re, reproducible, not only from a statistical viewpoint, but sometimes because the software or the algorithms or the data is not available. You make a publication and after that it's very difficult to find the, okay, the code or just uh, put to work the configuration, the initial configuration that uh, allow to test the, the results that are published in the publication. Um, uh, the presentation that Mohammed uh, is going to present or his research line was awarded with a grant of the European Union and recently I think he also will explain us during his presentation was awarded with a new project from Google um, more data about him he obtained a PhD in astronomy in the Tokoho University of Japan and he also was a postdoctoral fellow at CNRS in French. And okay, he's a specialist in this topic, and I expect that the presentation will be very interesting for all of us. And thank you, Mohamed. And when you want, we can, uh, you can start. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, Felix, for the, for the great introduction. <laughs> um, so it's a, it's a pleasure to be there. Thank you very much for inviting me. And I'm really happy to, uh, to, to see that this is also really a, a concern uh, beyond, uh, beyond our own immediate field. And uh, I'm really happy to be talking with professionals uh, in, in other fields as well and uh, sharing the viewpoints and um, yeah, making everything better for all of us in, in summary. So um, uh, as the title says, uh, so that we're going to be talking about, and as Felix nicely introduced, uh, about the problem of reprodu reproducibility and, um, and how we can solve it and the, the approach that we've adopted here. Um, okay, so uh, as an astronomer, since my main job is the, the, being an astronomer and astronomy is famous for beautiful images, um, uh, I'll start with this really nice image of the M51 galaxy. Uh, you can see uh, how, how beautiful it is. And uh, this actually gets me going into the subject of reproducibility. So for example, now this can happen in any field, but say you're an astronomer and you are interested in studying the, this galaxy. You wanna, you wanna detect this galaxy in the image and you want to you know, do science on it. Now this can be a cell in biology. It can be, I don't know, any kind of data in any, any branch of science. Um, uh, so, for example, you you get your image. You you go to your telescope. You take uh, you point the telescope to the galaxy. Okay. Take a minute. Uh, sorry, was there a uh, voice now? Um, so then, uh, yeah, you take the image and you come to your computer, and uh, then you want to start analyzing the data. So uh, there are many options, and in fact, uh, one of the options that I'll be talking about. Uh, just briefly, um, uh, in terms of uh, image uh, processing uh, also, is noise chisel. Um, so for example, if you just run noise chisel on the default parameters, um, you're gonna detect the edge of this galaxy this far out into the noise. Um, and, uh, but if you fine tune noise chisel for your, you know, for your galaxy, for your target, you tune the parameters, you play, the, you tweak them, um, then you can greatly improve the result. Look how far you can detect when you change the parameters. And uh, yeah, you can even see that even though you see nothing in the noise, the signal to noise here is one third. It's very, very low. Uh, so it's almost invisible in the noise, but there is significant signal. And you can actually see this in, in a much deeper image with more exposure time that uh, other people had taken. And you see that there is actually real signal here. Uh, but anyway, that's uh, I'll get to this in a moment. Um, but the main question is, yeah, uh, in your paper, uh, the, the, well, in most papers, when people write, uh, for example, you want to publish your results and say, I found the edges of most, you know, this galaxy this far out. So many people in their paper, they just say, we use noise chisel, that's it, you know? <laughs> so when someone else comes and uh, reads the paper and gets excited and then they want to uh, run the software on data, they're not gonna get this result, they're gonna get this one. Um, and then, yeah, it's gonna be completely, uh, you know, different. They're gonna get a different result. 
And the, so this is the core uh, idea of the problem that um, there, there should be a way because the main problem is that there are many parameters and there are many software. This is just one of them. And if you want to list the parameters of every software, your paper is gonna get like 50 pages just in the analysis section, <laughs> right? If you want to describe everything in, in English uh, sufficiently in, an, in, in a paper. So it's, it's practically impossible. I mean, to, to go into such the low level details in a science paper. Um, uh, so yeah, that's the goal of this uh, of this talk to introduce a method. But as Felix said, now that I uh, the, you know just introduced this image processing uh, method, um, I'm also going to just touch upon this noise chisel uh, software and algorithm for like uh, for about five minutes uh, or less. Um, just to show you besides uh, project management, well, my main job uh, as an astronomer doing uh, uh, working on deep data sets and, and the large data sets is to detect uh, these galaxies. So let me just uh, give a short introduction to this, uh, to this algorithm as one part of our image processing activities that hopefully maybe later we can talk about like maybe next week. Um, uh, so this is, the, this is a, just a visualization of the main algorithm. So over here you see a mock galaxy, a mock uh, elliptical profile. You can just think of it as a mock elliptical profile and without any noise. And then over here, I'm adding noise to it. Uh, and you see the wings of the galaxy, this, this mock profile are very, very low signal to noise. You, it's, they're invisible here in the noise. Um, so they're very low signal to noise in the center, but the center is high signal to noise. You see it? Um, so then the algorithm is uh, just uh, at the start, it's uh, very standard. So it just applies uh, um, uh, a simple convolution. So it's um, a Gaussian kernel. Oh, by the way, I'll make this full screen. Um, so it applies a Gaussian kernel to the image, a very sharp Gaussian kernel. And um, uh, okay, then the, the interesting part comes out here, uh, which is when we apply the threshold to be able to detect these galaxies. So usually people, you know, take a threshold of like one sigma or two sigma to apply uh, uh, to be able to detect these objects, but we apply a threshold of negative half sigma or a quantile of 0 0.3 negative. So it's like below uh, the noise level. <laughs> you see, this is if this is the noise distribution, the threshold is below the noise level, and that is because when faint signals are present, you actually see that um, you know the, the outskirts of the galaxy actually become uh, detectable. But the problem is that you know you reach the percolation limit, and effectively the whole image is covered. But while I was the, the, you know, looking at this, uh, I, I found out that, look, as we come out from the galaxy, the size of the holes that are regions below the threshold increases until they reach the noise. So uh, we just apply a simple mathematical morphology operator on it, erosion and dilation. And uh, through erosion and dilation, we're able to nicely detect uh, the galaxy out to very far, um, uh, very far out into the noise and uh, be able to successfully detect it and, uh, and study it. So for example, this is one image of a comet um, and uh, the, here are some galaxies and you see how nicely it actually detects uh, the, the outer edge. You see it's so faint, you see nothing here <laughs> in the noise, uh, but, but there is significant signal. If, if you put an aperture here, it's like 10 sigma significant. Uh, when you look at a large aperture. Uh, so you see, and it has a beautiful shape, just like a comet in the sky. Uh, but uh, yeah, so this is, uh, this is the image processing work. This is uh, just touching upon some of my image processing work um, that I really look forward to finding some kind of way that we can collaborate on expanding this with your uh, great experience in this field, uh, you know, both for astronomy and also for computer vision and uh, all aspects. Okay, so let me get back to, uh, so I just uh, just touched upon the, the algorithm and the way it works. Um, so if you just search noise chisel, the paper, oh yeah, this is the, this is the paper, I think. Yeah, this paper describes uh, the basic idea behind this image, this, uh, this link here. Um, okay, so let's get back to reproducibility. So uh, this problem has, uh, has, uh, is, is, is becoming, uh, it's been discussed a lot, but uh, recently, uh, in the last uh, 30, 40 years, but uh, in, in the recent uh, decade, it's been discussed a lot. For example, this paper, um, uh, Snakes on a Spaceship. So they actually review Python in, uh, in solar physics and heliophysics, and they, they actually really complain about this. They say inadequate analysis descriptions um, make the results impossible to replicate. And then there's another one, um, um, uh, <coughs> uh, which they say it just needlessly hampers uh, research. 
And another one in 2018, they actually went to and randomly uh, selected a large sample of astronomy papers. And um, uh, they saw, they counted how many of them actually mentioned, I mean, just mentioned the name of at least one software. And they found out that almost half of the papers don't even mention the name of one software. <laughs> and so this is terrible. I, it's not just the configuration. They don't even mention the name of the software they use. Um, so, uh, and then that's why they called their paper Schrodinger's Code instead of Schrodinger's Cat, like arguing that, uh, yeah, it's like uh, that paradigm. When you open a paper, there's like a 50-50 probability that, uh, yeah, you, there's no way you understand uh, in detail how it works. Um, okay, and this is not just limited to astronomy. So we also have um, uh, we also have this issue in um, in many other branches uh, as well. So, for example, over here you can uh, uh, sorry. So this this Zoom window just opened up, and I don't know how to close it. Okay. Uh, Okay, so um, yeah, so for example, this paper in uh, in gene analysis, they actually studied uh, in 2009, so it's not it's even more than a decade old. Uh, but look, they studied 18 papers in Nature Genetics, and they could only reproduce two of the two of the results. Um, or, the, or this one in Economy, uh, they studied 60 papers. Um, uh, yeah, but they uh, you see they were able to uh, actually replicate a very very low less than half of the papers reproduced less than half of the papers in very well regarded journals in Economy. Um, uh, and also in um, yeah in computer generally this paper by Studen in 2018 is relatively famous in uh, in this field. So they actually went uh, to Science, you know the journal Science. Science, which is you know one of the most prestigious uh, journals in, in science um, it publishes in all fields uh, and uh, yeah they took a random sample of 204 papers and they actually spent a lot of time to actually uh, read the papers go into the where they talk about data where they talk about software and try to reproduce their plots and uh, they were only able to um, uh, obtain artifacts for 44 percent and uh, you know reproduce without con contacting the author only roughly one quarter of the papers um, that they studied in science. Um, so this is this is a big problem, the, you know, in the journal science. Um, and uh, the Nature uh, in 2016 actually done a survey of, uh, of all the, of roughly 1,500 researchers that had actually published in Nature. And um, they actually asked everyone that, do you think there's a significant crisis? There's just a slight crisis? or there's no crisis at all. Um, and you see um, roughly 80%, more than 80%, almost 90%, well, exactly 90% uh, of the people said, yeah, there's a crisis. It's just like significant or um, not too significant, but still a crisis. And this actually involves many, many fields. So they, they've done an, a deep analysis of, uh, of what people, scientists actually experience because uh, they're not able to reproduce the results of other researchers. And as we all know, we've all had, had headaches, you know, when we see a paper, we try to, we like it, we want to continue the work, but we have to spend months uh, trying to figure out just by, you know, uh, playing uh, like the, the probable parameters that they gave to their software to get the result they got. And when you contact them, um, well, some people uh, have the code, uh, some people, most people, in my experience, when you contact them about the result, they just say, oh, yeah, that paper was like three years ago, and uh, um, I changed my computer and its code is gone, for example, or or something, it's lost, or um, um, or they give you the code, but it has a, but then they say, oh, this was the version I sent to the referee, like, uh, before publication, and then it's just so complicated, um, and um, yeah, so I, I'm sure. You've all experienced various aspects of this. Um, so let's just go into the definitions and uh, what we mean, because uh, this, this needs clarification, such that the US National Academies actually had to publish a report on this definition um, uh, of reproducibility and replicability. Because until this, uh, this, uh, this uh, review by the National Academies, uh, the, the replicability and reproducibility were used interchangeably, uh, which was really confusing. Um, so let's just clarify the things here. So by re replicability, we mean acquiring data, 
right? It involves data collection. It involves uh, when you go to the telescope or when you go to the microscope or when you go to the society and you have a survey, you submit to a large community. Uh, yeah, so it involves data collection. So for example, over here, do you see like this is an old image and look astronomers, this is the how, <laughs> you know, old astronomers actually had to work. Uh, so you see they're actually sitting in the telescope and moving with the telescope. Um, but uh, yeah, um, uh, so this, this subject of uh, how to collect data in a reproducible way, um, uh, you know, replicable way for the future is, uh, is the subject of replicability. It's of course very important, but it involves data collection and is very different from field to field. For example, in medicine, uh, like for the COVID uh, vaccine, for example, um, uh, there are different ways uh, than, for example, in astronomy or biology or geology. Uh, so this is very field specific. So we're not going to be talking about it here. Um, but uh, once the data are recorded as a file on the computer, from that moment on, you know, the raw data, they come onto the computer, they just become digitized and they, they're, they're in, your, in, in a file on your computer. From that moment on, we can generalize things. And we can say, okay, you have your raw data, how do you process it? From that moment on, we can actually uh, look uh, in a general way and that's what we're doing here. So for example, two plus two, if you have two apples or two galaxies or two, uh, or two uh, viruses, uh, they should always uh, equal four when you have, uh, yeah, but, but well, we all know that, uh, yeah, as, as I mentioned before, things are much more complicated than this. And in practice, this rarely, um, there's rarely enough information to get to this exactly reproducible. But theoretically, and as we'll show here, uh, in practically, it is possible uh, to, to make your work exactly reproducible uh, from the moment the data are in the computer. So, <coughs> okay, sorry. Um, so let's just have a look at the general outline of a project. So you have a software, right? And you have hardware, you have data. You have your data, you have your software, and uh, then you build your software, you run the software and the data, and boom, you have your paper. Uh, everything is uh, really exciting and you're gonna get published and uh, get good grants and uh, yeah, get, continue happily ever after, <laughs> right? Uh, but uh, yeah, there, there are some questions um, and we'll, we'll look at these questions one by one. So for example, what version of the software uh, was used to do the data? For example, over here, so when you ask many people, many people, um, uh, um, uh, when you ask them, like, what version of AstroPy? Now, these are two packages in astronomy for data analysis. Um, so, um, yeah, you ask them what version, and they say, oh, I just ran like uh, uh, apt-get AstroPy <laughs> or apt-get GNU Astro. And uh, yeah, and then you see they, they don't even know the version. Uh, so then, for example, over here, look, you see many different uh, GNU Linux distributions. And you see in each distribution, when you just use the default package manager, you get a whole scale of different versions depending on the version of your operating system, if you just use apt-get. Um, and uh, so, so you shouldn't use apt-get in summary <laughs> uh, because it just changes every day. Uh, now this is like uh, last year I got this image. If you get this today, it's completely different. The scale is uh, the, the versions uh, on different operating systems are just across the whole board. Look, some of them are version 0.3. Some of them are version 10. Uh, it's just uh, it's just very different. Uh, and then what repository you got the software from? Uh, when you built the software, what, what dependencies did the software have? Uh, and then the versions of those dependencies, they also, because a software you know, does its analysis through its dependencies. So if the versions of those dependencies also change, imagine having that same thing before because um, uh, you have all these different versions and uh, yeah, the configuration options, how did you configure the, uh, the software? How did you configure the environment? For example, uh, I guess you also, you, many people, I don't know, uh, in astronomy, many people use Python and the matplotlib uh, package inside Python for plotting, for example. Um, so look, this is the dependency tree of matplotlib. Right. Uh, look, there are these these blue ones are Python packages. Look, there's like almost 100 boxes here. And look, each one of these boxes is one software, and each one of these software has their own version history. Just look at this dependency tree. It's truly a nightmare. Um, anytime uh, one of these dependencies changes, something in your plot is going to change. Um, now, depending on the type of plot you make, or, or worse, when one of these breaks for the particular data or the particular operating system that you have, 
you can't even make the plot anymore. Uh, there's so many dependencies. Um, uh, this is, and this is just matplotlib. Like this is a dependency of that astro pi package that I mentioned, and it has much more complex dependencies um, um, than matplotlib. This is one of the most simplest. Uh, so it's really uh, a nightmare um, uh, when you actually go into the details, when you go down low level and actually want to, you know, make your work truly reproducible. So, for example, uh, this is from the Debian operating system. I'm just comparing those two software versions again. Um, because AstroPy depends on Matplotlib, among many other packages, it actually can't even be built on some CPU architectures. Look, it's not, it's not possible. Uh, Debian can't actually build it here. But then, for example, GNU Astro, uh, which is the software package that I'm maintaining, um, is all is uh, doesn't depend on doesn't have a complex dependency tree. So you see, it nicely builds on all the various uh, CPU architectures. Uh, so besides reproducibility uh, in terms of um, uh, execution, you also have reproducibility in terms of building the software for future hardware, for example. Um, Okay, so in this aspect, in this, in the aspect of uh, the software and the building, because we share this uh, problem with software engineers, and software engineers uh, also have this problem when fixing bugs, for example, and maintaining large software projects. Uh, fortunately, there are very good solutions uh, for this aspect of the job, just this part of the box. So as a, as a scientist, we actually have to look on a much larger scale, but just for this box, so for example, there's virtual machines that have existed for a long time. There are containers that uh, that are more recent uh, and they're, they're becoming really good. And then there are also a reproducible reproducibility um, uh, focused uh, um, uh, package managers and operating systems like Nix or GNU Gix, which are, which really they, they, they're they perfect in terms of uh, keeping the track of the dependencies of each software uh, all the way down to the kernel. Um, uh, and they're, um, yeah, they're also very good. Um, but uh, yeah, as you see, they're just a very limited scope compared to uh, the general problems that strong, you know, scientists uh, in general have. So for example, uh, let's get into the science world. So we have data. A, a paper is not just the software. There's data. Where did the data come from? Uh, the, how about the version of the data? Because some databases, unfortunately, um, you know, next year that they get new data, they just update the same URL or they just update the same. Um, uh, so when you download from the same URL, you're getting a different version of the data. And um, when you, when you, uh, how can you check for this? Um, uh, this is a real nightmare, uh, and I'm sure uh, many of you have, uh, have uh, touched upon it. Um, so, well, then we get to the much more complex aspect when you run the software on the data. So, for example, in that example, that initial case of that galaxy I showed, um, um, it, it wasn't just noise chisel to make those images. I ran like almost 20 software packages to make those images and do the analysis. Uh, how they, in what order would they run after each other? What runtime options did each one of those programs have? Uh, how can we record human error? Because we're human, right? And we make mistakes. Uh, we make typos. We make uh, uh, we make confirmation biases. You know, you're working for one month, two months on something, and you're not getting a positive result. As soon as you get your first positive result, it's just like uh, a mental thing that, oh, you know, we just we get to get so happy. We stop testing, and we we go on to the next step. And this is natural, otherwise we wouldn't even be able to take one step forward if we wanted to get too much focused into details. But this happens, we, we get to, we have a confirmation bias. How can we record this? How can we record the history of the changes that actually went? Uh, the uh, environment update, uh, how can we stay, you know, there's all of these questions here. How can we synchronize them with the co-authors? Um, and when we're writing the paper, um, so uh, are, are all the parts of the paper, if you change something here or here or here, uh, what's going to change in the paper? Is it in sync? Like once I was referring the paper and uh, in the abstract, they said, yeah, we found like 52 uh, galaxies like this. And then in the discussion, they ultimately found like uh, the 51. And then in the in the analysis, like they had 53. It was clear that like um, they, they were, as they were writing the paper, they were improving their methods. And um, yeah, but then they they couldn't stay up to date in terms of like writing the paper and uh, keeping it up to date. Um, and then in terms of software um, citation, because a lot of work goes into the software that used in research, but uh, many people, uh, you know, just forget 
to to even mention and uh, even cite the the papers papers of the software that have actually come out and this is a you know because software is really becoming a, a really um special thing in the sciences today uh this this quote from uh, De Cosmo and Pellegrini um uh, from Paris is uh, is a really nice uh, quote that says software is both a driving force as a tool uh it's a result uh, as a proof of concept of an existing solution and an object of its study. So software is really not just a tool anymore. It's not just like a hammer where you can just uh, change. Uh, whole pipelines are built around, uh, you know, the software that they do and they, there's many aspects to software. So, uh, and the history. So once you start a paper, usually you have a general idea. Once you get data, you start to improve the result. You make some th conclusions. Uh, and then as your analysis goes on, you, you improve those conclusions. How can you keep the history of this um, in your paper? So this is the question, right? So when there's so many questions that the traditional paper can't answer, uh, really, because if we want, as I mentioned, if you want to answer all of these questions, the paper is going to be 100 pages long. Um, and uh, yeah, no, no journal is going to publish that paper and no author is going to have the time to write that paper. Um, so, uh, but this is what happens. We need, we need these. So this is a really big problem. So really, how can you trust the results of such, um, you know, such a, such a paper? Would you, if you go to a restaurant and then you ask for like uh, some fish, um, um, and then, uh, and then, yeah, uh, when you ask the chef, uh, where did the fish come from? Uh, the chef says, I don't know. I just wrote apt get fish. <laughs> and then, uh, the fish were like, uh, brought to his table. Would you, would you eat that food? Would you, uh, would you trust that it's like, it's been raised healthy. It doesn't have any problems. It doesn't have any. So it's the same with science. It's the same with, um, um, with, with human progress, let's say in the, in the quantitative world, we need the, the, the lineage we need uh, you know the uh, the history of how a data set how a plot how something was produced um yeah because ultimately science is a really tricky business so this is a really nice uh, really nice figure I, from nature uh five ways to fix statistics in 2017 and uh, so they're like a bunch of really really well-known uh, statisticians uh, that actually write this paper and they say yeah data analysis is ultimately a human behavior it's not as objective as we like to think and um, uh, researchers who hunt hard enough will turn up a positive result but their discovery will probably be a false positive um, so this is just one quote this is a really nice paper i recommend uh, having a look at it um, and uh, just to conclude this introduction this really nice quote from uh, buck height and donahue in 1996 so it's not uh, it's not too recent it's like almost 30 years 225 years ago um they make a really nice point in their paper um, um and they say an article about computers computational science which is effectively all uh you know sciences today um is not the scholarship itself the article is merely advertising of the scholarship the actual scholarship is the complete software development environment and the complete set of instructions which generated the figures. Um, so this actually really nicely summarizes, summarizes up uh, what, I, what, what I tried to build upon up to this point, that um, we really need to get behind the advertising, behind the, the, the facade of research of the paper and go inside, go down into the core of exactly how uh, a result is generated. Okay, so... Um, we finished the introduction, let's get into uh, the principles behind the proposed solution. So uh, the basic, the most simple idea is that science is defined by its method, not its results. We usually, you know, we have the scientific method and we always think about it. Um, uh, we're proud to have the scientific method. Um, but in papers, yeah, you see that they, they focus more, many, oh, many papers, especially in public outreach, we focus more on the result rather than the methods. Um, and this is, um, this is, so the basic idea is that um, the method and publishing the method is as important. Well, it's much more important than just the results. Um, okay, so how do we get to this general uh, simple idea? Okay, so let's get a little more technical here. Um, uh, so the basic idea is that the project should be complete. So by completeness, we mean that it should not need anything 
beyond a POSIX uh, or a very minimalistic Unix operating system, which is today mostly the GNU uh, implementation of the old Unix, uh, like Debian, like Ubuntu, like, uh, you know, all of these various uh, Unix-based operating systems. And this is important. We can't like rely on something like Windows or Mac because they are proprietary software. They change every day uh their cores their source is not up to you know they're not public you can't see anything they're just a black box so if you really want uh, to go to the core or something you really need the uh, you know uh, your core to also be open and that is using uh the gnu linux you mostly today there's also bsd um uh, and the, well essentially unix like operating systems so for example there are many people that advertise the uh, jupiter or conda but they you know jupiter is such a complex system. It, it depends on Matplotlib that I showed before and just has the hundreds of extra dependencies beyond that. Um, so you can't just say, uh, you know, I'm writing in Jupyter and be happy about it um, because uh, Jupyter itself is going to be updated. And if you just, uh, if you don't build Jupyter, probably you can use Jupyter, of course, but as long as you can maintain that its dependencies and the dependencies of those dependencies are also under control. Um, uh, which is, well, uh, that's why we say that the, so if you build Jupiter in a, in a robust way, it's fine. But if you just say, if you just start from Jupiter, then there's a problem. Um, so it must not require root or administrator permissions, because as you know, many of the um, uh, high performance computing capable facilities that we have don't give root permissions to users. So for example, you can't use Docker uh, or you can't use Nix or Geeks. Those, those really cool, uh, really advanced solutions solutions that the software developers have built because software developers don't have the problem of roots. They have their own computer or they get their own cloud, you know, a virtual machine on some cloud uh, server and they have root permissions there. Uh, but life is hard as, an, as a scientist. Uh, so, you know, well, because we want to use the core. We want to, when we, when we submit a job to, uh, you know, HPC, uh, we want to extract every CPU cycle. We don't want to waste it on, you know, um, uh, on a virtual machine over head or, or things like that. Um, so it must not require root. Uh, it should be non-interactive. So it should be able to run in batch. So essentially you, you press enter, uh, you press run on your computer and you go to lunch and come back and everything from the software to the final plot to the paper should be fully um, uh, runnable in non-interactive mode. Um, and it should not need the uh, internet connection. So if your data is already on the computer, it shouldn't have to rely on, for example, downloading the software from an external source. It should be able to build the software uh, fully. So if you have the software and the data on your computer, the software source and the data, then it should be able to do it. So this is what we mean by completeness. It should be modular. So parts of the project can be easily reusable in other projects. It should be plain text. And this is a really important thing that um, many solutions today, um, like Conda are, are, and the many Jupyter users, unfortunately, are ignoring. Uh, so for example, they're keeping images or they're keeping, um, you know, a binary parts inside the Jupyter uh, notebook. Uh, so uh, yeah, so, uh, but the source should be plain text, no binary format because binary means uh, special software and plain text, you know, in ASCII or UTF-8, for example, uh, is really um, uh, the only thing that, uh, that, you know, will stay in the next 10 years. <laughs> uh, a binary format is going to change. It's so it's going to be so hard to uh, to 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 keep a binary source. Uh, but when it's plain text, it will be very small. It's human readable. You can even print it on the paper. You can even ask someone to carve it into a stone. You know, uh, like thousands of years ago. So you can actually look into long longevity. You can like you can look into the future when you when your source is plain text. It can be under version control, so you can keep the history of your project. So and it should have minimal complexity. So for example, um, uh, you know, uh, in in the early two thousands, Python suddenly became a, a really fashionable language. Everyone started. To to use Python, and then suddenly Python 3 came, right? Uh, so all of those codes effectively were in the rubbish bin. You know, today in 2020, um, uh, Python 2 was discontinued officially. So Python 2 is a, a dead language, effectively. It's not officially maintained anymore. And in like in 10 years, 
Uh, really, I mean, the, the Python 2 code is only going to be seen in the museums. You can't reproduce science, uh, scientific results. Uh, if it, so the same is happening today, and it's even much worse. So there's, there's an explosion of new languages every day. And um, if you just use the most fashionable language that comes out today, uh, you're going to have the same problem because it evolves really fast and then it's just going to get thrown away by because software engineers have a whole different perspective. Um, so they want a fast solution. Uh, unlike science, they have, they make money from software. So unlike us scientists that have to apply for government grants and use tax money, um, they, uh, they make money from the software so they can afford to update their work. But as scientists, we really, we can't uh, spend three quarters of our grant money on uh, on keeping the software up to date. Um, so we really need to think in terms of long-term. And um, yeah, all the, you know, more basic software also have a much, uh, the, avoid the generational gap where, you know, uh, I, I'm sure as, as PhD students, for example, when you were PhD students, you had problems communicating technically with your advisors because maybe they used a whole different language. They hold, used a whole different software method in their days. Um, so it's really hard to, to get this experience going. Um, and uh, yeah, inputs and outputs should both be verified automatically. So um, uh, ideally, exactly bitwise reproducibility. So after like two days of analysis on HPC, the final result really should be ideally bitwise reproducible and if not statistically reproducible, but the test to make, to verify the results should be automatic. And finally, it should be free software. So, and uh, well, I, the, after all this discussion, it's almost obvious, but this was important to mention uh, that if you don't use free software, then yeah, don't think about reproducibility uh, because uh, it's not, it's <laughs> the software. I mean, the core, the core analysis method is not free. So um, yeah, uh, so yeah, you, you, you know, uh, you can't, uh, you can't keep it yourself. You can't distribute it. You can't change it. You can't, uh, you can't, uh, you can't do anything <laughs> in two years when, uh, when the, when the when that proprietary software gets changed to a new version, you're gone. You're, you know, you're, you're completely at the mercy of the, the company. Um, so, uh, okay, so let's see how uh, we apply or we implement those principles. So we're going to get a little technical here, actually showing plain text files. So don't uh, don't hate me for it, please. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, it's just going to be a general outline. I don't expect you to actually read the read the plain text files. So for example, uh, the, the 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 issue of uh, you know building the software. So uh, in the in the in the in the project, as I mentioned, it's all plain text. So we have a file called versions.mk, and it's a huge file. So it has many, many different, uh, all the versions of the software are precisely mentioned. So look, for example, now uh, those, those same software I mentioned before, I'm highlighting them here. You see their exact versions are, are in this file and um, you know, and document and kept in the source of the project. So then the project has, uh, has scripts to um, to download, uh, for example, over here, you can see in the case for the GNU Astro, for example, look, it has all of the dependencies of GNU Astro and then they in turn have their own dependencies. And we have the full build instructions to build GNU Astro from its source, uh, including many other software. So for example, matplotlib uh, is also here with that huge dependency tree. Um, we've, we've actually taken it all the way down to the C compiler, which is the main compiler of the operating system. Um, so we actually even build the C compiler, then we build uh, the low level environments, then we build the high level dependencies, then we build the high level science software. And all of these are managed uh, all in plain text. So in, in this aspect, it's very much like apt or brew, but it, it builds the software from source on your machine with the predefined configuration. So for example, you can see exactly the configuration options that we built each software, um, like Image Magic, Ghost Script, Gnu Astro, and many, many more. This is just a snapshot of the file. And we fully track uh, the environment. The build environment of the software is also fully under control. Uh, again, so all of these dependencies you see here, it took us like almost one and a half weeks to, <laughs> uh, to, 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 to build the dependencies of Matplotlib, but we're happy that it's finally done. Uh, so now again, uh, like um, Matplotlib and many more higher level software are now also fully 
uh, buildable inside the, this the system that we're proposing here. So, for example, uh, you see this is, and we, we we tested a lot on both the Linux and Mac OS. Now, I mentioned that it's uh, um, uh, it's favorable, it's favorable to build uh, on um, you know on free operating systems. Uh, but well, uh, unfortunately, many people use Mac OS. But fortunately, Mac OS is also uh, based on Unix. Uh, so, um, for example, where you see we're able to build all of the dependencies with the exactly the same uh, software version. Look, that is the version of like the libjpeg or uh, um, libssl to connect with uh, with servers or the cryptography um, uh, libraries or the compression libraries and so on. You see, they're exactly identical all the way in, in terms of um, dependencies. But, but this is Mac OS architecture, this is GNU Linux architecture. Uh, and in GNU Linux, we're also planning, we're also working hard to add the C library as well. Uh, so once we add the C library, um, uh, it's going to be, even these blue ones are going to be green. So they're gonna be exactly under control. Um, but in Mac, uh, there's no way. So in Mac, we can't really go that low level. Um, um, uh, and yeah, we hit a, hit a wall uh, because uh, you know Apple doesn't like us to see how they do things. Um, okay, so um, so uh, you see that just in terms of software environment, we build Bash, we build the command line, we build Make, we build like all of these low-level tools, LSCP, MKDIR. We even build LaTeX to actually build your paper with. Uh, and there's no root permissions needed. So you just uh, so when when you go to your HPC and you want to run, you just uh, specify a build directory in your in your user space. And you just build the project there, and then you, you distribute it over uh, many, you know, the, all of the HPC cluster and everything, um, um, uh, without without needing to like send the you know one week of coordinating with the HPC administrator. Do you have this version of this software? Do you have that version of that software? And then you spend one week analyzing on the HPC, and then. Uh, in the end, when the results come, you say, you see, oh no, I forgot that like the dependency of that software was like an older version or something. And then now, uh, you know, all these headaches that I'm, uh, I've experienced a lot and I'm sure <laughs> uh, many people have also had. Um, so this is effectively the end uh, of that trouble. And we'll also let the HPC maintainers get to what they do best, which is maintaining the HPC, not answering our questions about the versions of software. Um, uh, so yeah, and then they don't conflict. So in one version, in one uh, project, you can have one version of software in another project, you can have another version. It's completely independent. They never see each other. So we have the full dependency uh, build of every project separately. Uh, and again, everything is in plain text. So it's really easy to keep an archive. And because we actually build the software, we, and because we're scientists, we actually keep a citation record of every software that's used. So for example, this is one paper and we actually give the user a LaTeX uh, macro um, that they can put into their paper and it will automatically list every software they use with the version, with a possible citation if the paper comes with a citation. So you can be safe and feel happy that if you use a software, the author of the software uh, is going to be credited scientifically, you know, if, uh, if you use uh, that paper and that software. And this is like another paper. So this paper uses matplotlib uh, from Python and you see the huge dependency tree as uh, a huge paragraph, but over here, this one doesn't use Python. Uh, you only uses GNU Astro. So you see the dependencies are much less, it builds faster, it's uh, much more stable and needs much, much fewer dependencies. Okay, so we've done the software part. Now the, the, the hardware or the data part, where the data come from. So there's another plain text file in the source and this file, look, it has URLs. So this is the, the source of this paper of mine. Um, and the, the, for, for this project, I used three data sets. Like you can see one image I got from NASA, one image I got from the Space Telescope Science Institute, one, one day catalog I got from uh, like the SDSS server. And now these are like, um, uh, you know, different databases in astronomy. You can just think of it like this. You see the exact URL is given, uh, the name of the file is given, and now most critically to check for the integrity, so in case the server changes the data, we keep the MD5 checksum of the data that is downloaded. Look, we actually keep this checksum in the source of the project. So if you build your project today and then the server tomorrow changes its data set and someone else tries to run the project, the project is going to stop and it's going to check the checksum. And if it's different, the project is gonna tell the user, be very careful because the checksum has changed. 
So something in the file has changed. Um, so the result, uh, your raw data has changed. So the result is definitely something is going to change uh, inside that project. We actually keep a record of the checksum of the data as well. And okay, now get to the um, the more exciting, uh, the high level science part. So for a high level science, we use Make. Uh, Make is a very basic uh, job organizer, which uh, which is used by the Unix operating system to build all its software. And even today, so it's like almost more than thirty years. Sorry, forty. I think it was it was published first in nineteen seventy four, and it's still being used. It's still being maintained. Um, because yeah, all software depend on it effectively. And um, um, uh, so it's something that, uh, you know, even your grand, your academic grandparents <laughs> know about, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the advisors of your advisors. Um, but, um, and, and the best thing is, the same is going to be in the future. So your academic grandchildren, the, you know, the students of your students are also going to have make. Uh, for sure. And uh, so this is something that everyone can understand in multiple generations already and into the future. So it's really simple. And the basic idea is that you can, um, you know, you define a tar receive, receipt. So this is a receipt and uh, you define a target. So this is a target file. This is just the name of a file. Now this is a variable here. And then you define the dependencies and then um, uh, you say the rule, the, the recipe, to, to build uh, uh, the targets from the prerequisites. It's so simple. Um, <coughs> it's manual is like only 100 pages, the, the main part. Um, and it's so simple and basic um, and powerful because it's multi-threaded, you know, huge projects like the Linux kernel are built with make. So it's, you know, huge project. This is a huge, the Linux kernel itself is larger than any scientific project. Um, uh, and it's maintained in this, in this workflow. So it actually defines a really nice workflow to de have dependencies. And then you see that this target here becomes a dependency of this one. So it's actually able to build a really nice um, dependency graph. Look, I'm just flipping between them. You actually are able to define the dependencies and continue your analysis really nicely. Um, and the best thing is you record it and you keep history of it because it's all plain text. Um, and finally, the paper. So in the paper, because this is the part where everyone sees the first, right? Once you publish the paper, the, the paper is what they see. So this is, for example, one part of the noise chisel paper that uh, image the analysis software I mentioned. Um, look, <coughs> uh, this, uh, you see, this is one paragraph of that, uh, of that paper. And uh, look, you see these three numbers in the PDF? Uh, these three numbers in the PDF are not numbers. So while I was typing the source, the LaTeX source of this PDF paper, I didn't write numbers. I wrote LaTeX macros. And then these LaTeX macros are all coming from a single file that has all the macros. Look, effectively every single number I used in this paper, which came from my own analysis, uh, actually comes from this single LaTeX macro file that has all of the numbers. Look. You see them? The, everything is here. For example, this is exactly those three numbers you saw in the PDF. Look here, you see 1.89, 2.37, and you see 1.89, 2.37, and 4. It's exactly the same. And this, in, this is a really large file. It includes every single number I used in the paper, in the table, in within the text, or within a, within a figure. Um, and then where does this come from? This comes automatically, like from the single part of the code. You see the single file, this is a simple loop. This is a function and then this is called inside the loop. And it actually writes all three of these macros uh, automatically into that later file immediately after the analysis. So look, like I do the analysis that I done like to get these three numbers for this part of the paper. And then this is the part, this actually writes these numbers inside the single file for all the project. And then that actually puts it in the paper. So, you know, you can you can write your code comfortably. <laughs> you know, if you if you change something, you just uh, in your analysis, you don't have to go searching your paper. Where did I use one point eighty nine? Uh, now it's like one point ninety two, or like now it's one point seventy five, or something. You don't have to worry about it anymore. You can comfortably change things. And this is this is the thing when you talk to many scientists, like in conferences, you go and then you see they've done a nice work. And then you go to them and then you say, okay, how about changing this part? It fixes the result. Uh, you know, it makes it much better. And then, yeah, they agree. But then they say, oh, but my paper is in the last days and I can't spend the time to go changing everything again. You know, those days are gone. You can really comfortably change something, see the result. If it's good, keep it. 
And if it's not, just throw it away. Um, it's so easy. Um, and for example, over here, I'm showing uh, the results of uh, one uh, data set that we reproduced for the managed paper. So this is a, this is a plot from this paper here um, um, that actually done a, you know, a machine learning method to, to find how many papers in, in bio, biological research um, uh, mention software. <laughs> because you know, like, like the other paper, many, many papers don't cite software officially. They mention the name. Um, but well, it's up to, it's really hard to find which part. So they actually use the language analysis and machine learning to be able to find how many papers cited software. <laughs> uh, and over here, you can see in, the, in time uh, how they, they done they, they, their results. So this green one is the software. Um, so they also like look at cells and the different things, but like software is one of them. Um, and uh, yeah, you see like the, the, the mentioning of software names has improved. So this is that good news. Uh, in papers from 2000 up to 2015, uh, many more papers are citing software. Well, not officially citing, just mentioning software. Um, so yeah, fortunately they had their data on their um, on bio archive, which they had. And uh, so we got the data and as part of the paper, we actually reproduce the, the green line here. And we actually even go back because in, in their data set, they actually have data from uh, years before this as well. Um, so yeah, you can see from here, from 1996 onward, it's exactly the same as this plot here. So how did we do it? So this is a, a graph just to show the process. Look, the final result is the paper. So, you know, in make, uh, you look from the end to the start. The final result is always where you start with. Um, so my goal is to build paper. Where does paper come from? It comes from paper.tech and references because also the references of the paper are kept within the project. And then, okay, to build the paper, we need project.tech. This project.tech is that same file that had all the latex macros, right? So paper.tech is only built when project.tech is built. Okay, when is project.tech built? When verify.tech is done. So when verify MK actually verifies every single number uh, that I, I, do in the, I use in the paper. And these are all automatic. So it's not a trouble. Even if you have huge tables, uh, there are automatic scripts to do the verification. Don't worry about manually having to verify every number. Uh, there are really simple scripts that can do the job really fast and easy. Okay, where does verify.mk come? Where the, the verify, uh, what does it verify? So the, the first thing is like the basic, the most basic project, the very low level project settings and like git things and, um, and so on. But okay, besides that, <coughs> it also verifies the plot. Like, you know, essentially the data, the data you see here, it verifies this plot.txt that you see here. This is the source of that plot there. And then uh, this is the number, so tools per year. You see, this is the dot text. This is a plain text table, right? That has all of those numbers that go into the histogram that make the plot. And then where does this come from? This is, comes from actually the formatting of uh, their original data set. Where does the original data set come from? It's, a, it's an Excel file. Um, uh, so then we actually use a free software project to convert it into plain text. Um, so yeah, it's an Excel file. And where does Excel come from? It comes from that inputs file that you saw. It had the URL with the checksums of all the inputs. So you see everything from the inputs, the URL, it will automatically download automatically reformat, automatically do the analysis, make the plot, verify the result, write project.tech to use the numbers in the paper. And there's also more things. So you know, for example, in the paper, you also want to put a link to the URL that you downloaded, or you want to uh, mention something about uh, like the number of, uh, of input like mm, journals that they studied or something like that. Uh, you also bring these as latex macros, and then all of these get verified um, during this step uh, to build the final paper. And then you can also have different configurations. You see these green ones, are the files that are under version control and part of the project. The blue ones are automatically built files. And you can easily scale this up. So like the dotted lines here are just a hypothetical scenario that you would like to you know, add more analysis steps. So you see, it's really easy to just have different um, you know, analysis steps, just scale up the project to really large uh, cases after, for example, you do things without touching any of the existing parts. Um, so this is what I mean by a modular approach. <coughs> And uh, so I'll, I'll skip this part too, um, because yeah, it's already 50 minutes, but um, yeah. Uh, so this is just a general file structure you see. 
Um, um, the, the project, these green ones are again, the plain text source files. So you see there's, there's a project in the project, you have these top level things, and then you have a reproduce directory. Yeah, and then so you see everything here is, uh, and then within the reproduce, you have a software and analysis. So this, this controls the software building part, this controls the analysis part, and this controls the tech part where you want to actually build the paper. Okay, so this was a general outline of the project. Now it gets, now let's add one more dimension to it. Since it's all plain text, it can all be stored as Git. So um, with Git, you have the full history. So I don't know how many are familiar with Git here, but let's just do a fast thing. So you have, for example, you have your project today with all of the settings we discussed, everything is now here visually. You can just think of it today, this project is here. Okay, tomorrow you add something, right? You add a new plot, you change something. Um, with Git, you actually keep them as a commit, uh, as, a, as you keep a history and the history actually gets a name, it gets a hash. Uh, okay, so now this is how the whole system works. We have this core manage branch. So manage is short for managing data lineage, right? So we have this core manage branch, which is independent of any single project. So you want to start a project today. You go to the manage branch, you pull the most recent commit and you start your branch, you create a Git branch from the manage branch and you start your project. You start modifying things. You add your title, you add your author name, you add an abstract, and then you start to add your data analysis things. Like in the second commit, you add your input data sets. And then over here, you start adding your analysis. But in the meantime, you know, right now, like more than 20 projects are using manage and we're getting feedback. So a lot of very good feedback from different projects and it's just improving. The core infrastructure is improving. So in parallel to your project, the core infrastructure is also improving. Like people are testing it on different operating systems, finding software bugs or finding analysis improvements. Um, but the great thing is that because it's Git, you can always merge into the core branch again and update your project's low level infrastructure without touching your high level like input data sets and analysis and things like that. And you know, your project can just easily go ahead as and manage in the background will also go ahead and you can always update it. And the great thing is when you publish your paper, you can actually uh, put the Git commit uh, into the paper, into the paper's PDF. And uh, by doing this, uh, you know, you actually rec record with, you know, <laughs> uh, ultimate precision, uh, the exact state of the project and everything, all the changes before it um, uh, of the state of the paper. So for example, when you first publish the referee, you send the referee paper and then you answer the referee. Each one of these will have a different code and uh, your co-authors can always, you can always like, you know, when you send to the referee, it takes two months for them to answer. You make work, you do work, um, you improve the thing. And then when the referee reply comes back, you can always check how many of the referee's questions you may have already answered, for example. Um, and like this, you can actually verify, really, really do a, do a fully uh, verifiable science paper. So for example, in these two papers, we've actually done that. And we actually put the Git commit inside our abstracts, right? So even the abstract, so this is even the part of the paper that's publicly published even on uh, proprietary journals. Um, and uh, yeah, so in the abstract, we have the Git commit that allows people to verify. Um, for example, uh, this is, and then because it's Git, you know, people can use any kind of workflow. So for example, this is manage again, this is the project. And, you know, inside the project, while the paper is still being worked on, you can always just, you know, make a branch and then one of your co-authors can do some things in parallel to you. And then like after one month, it comes back with a finished plot and then you can easily just merge it in. It's just so easy to apply these kinds of workflows. And even more exciting for the whole community, once the paper is published, people can just branch off your project, merge it with manage, update the core infrastructure like in 10 years time when like things in the low level computer parts have changed, they can just update the managed core infrastructure, build your project and then start you know, working on that instead of having to do guesswork and public spending months trying to uh, reproduce your work. Okay, so um, we're approaching the conclusion. So <coughs> in total, you saw the whole source is uh, just plain text make files, a latex source files, and some configuration files. Um, so the whole source is like usually 100 kilobytes or something. Um, and it's so easy to publish this like on archive or bio archive with the latex source of the paper. You can put it on software heritage, uh, which is which is a really interesting project. Uh, and it's even backed by UNICEF and the United Nations to actually keep a heritage of human uh, coding, <laughs> you know. Uh, so for example, this is like,
like the managed paper and clicking on it now. You see, like this is the managed paper on software. The whole thing is like a few hundred kilobytes. Uh, so you see, like this is the thing. And if you want to see how we made those plots, look, this is on software heritage. It's not on my computer or anywhere. I'm opening from a web page. Look, I'm just going into the analysis. And then you want to see, um, uh, for example, how I done one part of the analysis, like how I made the uh, the the format, uh, the formatting step. Uh, look, you come here, and here you go. You this is the make file that done the formatting. You see the exact commands I used. It's just uh, in terms of even if the journal gets um, uh, you know stops publishing and gets bankrupt, um, the source of the project with the latex source. Everything, um, everything is here. In fact, I even put the referee answers, so the peer review question <laughs> answers are, are here, and I got permissions from the from the editors to do this. Um, so, because the whole history is here, you even can go to the first paragraph I started to write this paper with and see how it worked. So, yeah, because ultimately, um, uh, yeah, programs uh, or here scientific projects must be written for people to read and only incidentally for machines to execute. Um, so, okay, uh, how do you run the project? In short, this is a really fast uh, series of steps. Look, you just clone the project with Git. You configure it to build the software. This usually takes like one or two hours. It builds everything from the compiler up. Um, and then just run project make. It will do the analysis and make the final PDF. So in this paper, it's really short. So we'll, like this will just finish in like uh, two minutes. Um, and uh, uh, yeah. So in conclusion, um, so yeah, you saw how we can, uh, it's it's a wonderful resource for training PhD students or researchers in other fields. Don't have to spend months trying to understand what, <laughs> what you've done in your paper. Uh, and yourself, I mean, more important than others is yourself in five years. Uh, you, you know, you, you once you change your computer or lose your directory, the whole thing is on the internet in several, you know, uh, repositories. Um, and uh, yeah, easy verification, really trivial testing by the community, uh, science progressing incrementally because, like in, in astronomy, for example, as one branch of science, the main, the, the main volume of the paper is that people uh, spend uh, many, many figures and many, many pages trying to describe that their analysis, for example, conforms with the analysis of another paper to be able to conclude that their analysis, uh, their result is like uh, building upon that work. But with this, it's so trivial. You don't have to spend like 10 pages, like 60% you know, of your paper, justifying your analysis is similar to another. You just uh, clone their project, make a branch over it, and you know you have a two-page paper that you can just focus on your new result with like changing two parameters in their analysis, um, and you can extract metadata for um, um, uh, you know do automatic uh, scripts that will parse all of these make files, go into all of this dependency graph and the lineage, and make very rich metadata sets for uh, large-scale uh, science uh, analysis. You know, meta science, let's say science that studies science, um, and more excitingly, you can apply like uh, machine learning. So when then, for example, imagine 1,000 papers on um, like uh, cell biology use manage, for example, to uh, to publish their results. Then you can actually feed that the pipelines of all those 1,000 projects into a, into a customized machine learning scenario and uh, automatically create full workflows. Everything from where the data should come from, what software versions should be built, how the analysis steps should be done. Everything because it's recorded, we can easily, um, you know, imagine a time if if it's used on a large scale in many scenarios, uh, just automatically say, okay, I want to study this like star forming galaxies. Find the best data set and the best software to do it. <laughs> you know, uh, it will automatically, assuming everyone done a good job, uh, find uh, the best way. Okay, so about this uh, this grant that we got last year, that's the end. Um, uh, I'll just conclude with some things. So yeah, we we're fortunate enough that RDA uh, through the European Horizon 2020 gave us a. Really Really good grant uh, in the last two years, and we were able to spend them a lot on uh, how you know sp spreading the word about this and uh, inviting people here uh, to start using it, putting up workshops and things like that. It was it was great, and also investing in manage itself. Okay, I'll leave the comparison with other solutions, and I'll finish with this slump summary. So the plot, the the slides are here. Uh, you know, you can just go to this link and download the slides I showed. Um, um, for more technical details on the project, you can see the readme and of course the managed paper. And of course, feel please feel free to contact me anytime you have.
if you're interested. Um, oh, and Felix has also said uh, we also got a Google Summer of Code uh, uh, position. So we're applying um, um, to for GNU Astro. So if you're interested uh, in image processing with GNU Astro um, uh, and your students, so this only applies to students, um, uh, you please contact me and we have some exciting projects that you can join and get paid by Google to, um, uh, to work with us on it. Okay, thank you very much. I'll finish here, just about one hour. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Mohammad. Okay, I think it was a very, very interesting presentation, and we have some time for some questions if you want. Yes, please. Uh, I'm, I'm available. Okay. If you have questions. Uh, okay, I can do someone while we wait for the rest of the people to ask some things. Okay, uh, okay, I, I think that as you present to us, okay, it's a so important problem, problem, so relevant problem just now because, okay, I don't know if you can comment something more mm -hmm. uh, about your experience or what do you think about the future because we see that we are publishing a lot of papers and a lot of algorithms and a lot of information, and, but and most, and most, I think, an important part of the resource if we don't change the way in which we are doing the things in some years will be completely inaccessible as exactly. this example you presented at the beginning about nature and science and this is uh, which is in really incredible for me is in that is that in this top sign publications you have so big important problems so so important problems i don't know which will be, okay, I don't know how it will be in other cases, because, okay, if, if in science or in nature, you have the problem of reproducibility of resources that you mentioned, in other cases, it will be close to impossible to <laughs> exactly. reproduce the resources that you find in the literature. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. It's, it's uh, yeah, uh, I, I'm sure you also have experience in your field. Uh, it, uh, even when you can reproduce, uh, something you have to spend months um, trying to contact the person, uh, get the things they have kept, um, trying to find the data sets they used. Um, exactly, and then that was exactly what led me to all of this because yeah. Luca, essentially I was writing. It started from the end, actually historically, if I want to say, um, uh, I was writing this paper. Right. And then while I was writing this paper, I was also defining that algorithm for image processing. Yeah. Um, so. You know, every time I was a PhD student at that time in 2015, uh, well, 2000 before 2000, it got published in 2015. So um, in 2013 and 14, uh, I was going to my advisor with like a, a change in the algorithm and then uh, the change the results. And then every time I came back from my advisors, we had like new, new, you know, yeah. ideas. So then I implemented the ideas. Then I had to spend like one day <laughs> going through the paper and changing like this number to that number, changing this figure to that figure. And yeah, after one point, I said, this is crazy. I'm not going to waste my time like this. Yeah, um, uh, some cases here at the center, they were talking with some researchers that in order to compare some results with other results that were published in the literature, okay, it was for them very, very difficult. They have to ask for the code. They have to repl replicate the code because the code is, is in, it, the original code it is in working on okay, a lot of problems for exactly. replicating the things. And, yes. Um, moreover, um, one question that I have, okay, I know that, um, okay, you develop this platform, this methodology, and do you think that people will adopt it because you are proposing just a big change in the way in how we are doing the things? Yes, uh, yes, it's over, much... I yes. think that in some cases you have to be... Okay, uh, like, uh, okay, you have to know perhaps uh, a lot of program language and environments and a lot of, okay, or, or no, or, or I am. So the basic, so for example, let's say, let's say you're already using, well, because researchers are already do using something, right? We, yes. You don't have to change your programming language. Like if you use Python, if you use Java, if you use Julia, if you use, uh, Perl, um, uh, it's really up to you. We can build, we build all of these inside manage for you. Okay. Right? So we build the C compiler, then from that we build the R, we build Python, we build uh, 
Perl we build uh, right now. I think these are the main languages we build. It's easy to add Julia. It's easy to add Java. Um, uh, so we create the software. So within Manage, it builds the compiler for the different languages. So no, you don't have to change your language. But uh, what I've seen is that many researchers don't even know Git. Yeah. Um, and this is this is hard. <laughs> so this is this is something they have to learn if they want to use this system. I mean, and and for me it's surprising. I mean, when when I learned that many people don't but use it. That. Okay, yeah, yeah. I think that okay, if, if, as you know, okay, research is so focused that sometimes you don't know. Okay, the elements you need to in order to properly okay use those. The, all these tools okay Perhaps exactly, you are all, exactly. Okay. Yeah. yeah or so like generally what i've seen is the thing they have to learn um uh, is git and later i mean well they know they know very basic later but usually later is something that they also have to learn and uh, make uh, for that general orchestration for the for the job uh, you know orchestration uh, once they learn uh, so this is what i've seen so far with uh, with the people that are starting but generally, I feel that uh, the postdocs and PhD students um, are the most comfortable for this because they are just starting, and uh, they, uh, you know, they, once they learn these, they can expand it. Because look, if you noticed in this thing, I didn't even mention one new programming language, right? Because if you look in the literature on reproducibility, every paper on reproducibility that comes out defines a new language, a new language, an extra language. <laughs> so like in the editors, with the editors while we we're discussing about this paper, I mentioned, look, this is the first paper that the latest technology used in the paper is already 20 years old. <laughs> you know, So like Git is the most recent uh, component of the project. And um, so if you learn these, so when, when you learn Git, when you learn later, when you learn make you can generalize it far beyond this because it's used it's a very these are all very low level components that you can expand they're not just for manage or for your science paper you can use them uh for for many things um yeah like one of the students here after he learned git he actually even like uh, you know had uh, his his personal documents in git <laughs> no. uh he actually showed me that he was so happy to see to see it and to use it so it's yeah they're they're all expandable and that that was one of the things i really tried to focus on and we discussed this in the at the end of the paper um uh, that these are really critical tools and they're the most low level tools uh for a modern scientist okay is there any question? I, yeah. Yes, I have a question. Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mohamed, by your talk. Uh, actually, I had to, I couldn't attend all the talk because I have another a meeting, but uh, I found it very, very interesting. Um, then my question, maybe it was already answered, you know, during your exposition, but uh i wonder how you see uh, what's your opinion about the the, con the the containers the software containers such mm -hmm. as docker and so on in order to try to have like a more close or um, uh, reproducible uh, environment yeah so, any 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 tip on this i think would be yes good. yes 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 in fact uh, in the paper after the referee report uh, we added like an almost 20 page appendix <laughs> uh, that i think spends two or three pages only on containers uh, so yeah i can if you like i can talk a lot about containers but but to summarize uh, so yeah for a more detailed discussion it's in the paper and the paper is here so you can uh, this is the link um, um so okay so in summary uh containers are good for temporary like in, what i call immediate reproducibility right so you um uh, you have your container and you want to just move your project like you you know your your it department is saying your computer needs to be updated so you want to move to another computer it's really good you can you can just use a container to avoid uh, building for like uh, two hours the new project um uh, and to continue your project but the problem with containers is that they're binary. So for example, yeah, in a container, you have a specific version of matplotlib in Python, for example, to build your plots, right? But how was that matplotlib built? No one knows <laughs> within the container. I mean, it's a black box. Uh, you don't, um, it keeps the, the actual software, that's correct, but it doesn't have the instructions to build it. So if, if someone wants to reproduce the container, 
they're going to have trouble. And now this is where the, the, we can actually extend the discussion to several years. In five years, the software, the, the operating system is probably going to get updated so much that, that, that the container isn't even going to be able to run. And because it's binary, you can't do anything. And because, uh, because the, you don't have the instructions to build the software uh, or reproduce the container, uh, again, uh, your hands are tied. Um, but uh, for example, in, uh, in manage itself, if I go to the, the project here, uh, I actually tell, I actually encourage people to, when they're working on a specific project during its development, uh, you can always uh, just, uh, 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 I, there are actually instructions to build the project uh, in a container, look I, like Docker, for example. Uh, there's a whole section in the readme file. Uh, you see the building in Docker containers. And uh, so like you can develop your project inside the container and you can easily like give it to your coworkers or um, uh, you know, move to another computer in your lab or, or things like that. In that scenario, for short-term things, containers are good. And when you can build the container reproducibly, like with manage here, because in manage we build uh, even the C compiler, your container can be exactly reproduced in the future. So containers aren't independent of manage. What we're proposing here uh, in terms of containers can be seen as a way to reproduce your container, make a reproducible container. Okay. Okay, I have okay, one thanks. more question. Uh, okay, sorry, Alejandro. Okay. No, 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 okay. Okay, Thank you. I have one more question. Okay. Perhaps this is more philosophical. Mm -hmm. What I mean, okay, because I think that you are approximation. Okay, I am not a um, specialist in te technology just now, but I think that your approximation is really convenient. This you have okay, like a uh, limited project. I mean, you have data and you have some algorithms or okay, or so, some tools in order to process that data. But sometimes, for example, in engineering, it's very common that, for example, putting an example, talking about. Language, language technologies, for example, you are combining mm -hmm. a lot of different technologies in order to provide a platform or a result or analyze, okay, some, and or proposing a solution to do something with this, for example. And I don't know in this case if an approximation like that, it will be useful because, okay, when you have to combine or to integrate different technologies, and it's a part of research the, the, in the field mm -hmm. of technology, do you, you think that you could do something similar or you could, I don't know, okay, with trying, okay, evolve an approximation like that to work, like yes. more, uh, to work with platform or with other, okay, with some... So do you mean, just to clarify, do you mean hardware or software technology? I mean software, mainly. Okay, so if it's software, we can build the different technologies. We can build the So I, as I mentioned, like you can build a, a, a Python, you can build Java, you can build Julia, and you can you can you can run them all together within the project. If there's software, it's fine. If it's hardware, yeah, that gets tricky because uh, if it depends on the specific hardware, but as long as it's software, um, uh, and that software is free software, um, um, uh, it's it's trivial to add it. Uh, so, like for example, in our data set, so maybe we can like discuss this next week in the gem, like in the more technical one. Um, uh, the we have data. We have like well, we, we, our telescopes. When we take data, when we go to one night and come back, we have like one terabyte of images, and we just feed it into this. It's so easy. Um, uh, you know, in terms of volume of data and complexity of analysis, many, many it goes through many steps, um, uh, and uh, we keep the whole thing. So if it's a software uh, technology um, and the software is free software, um, uh, it's really easy to add. You just have to add its build instructions, that's all. Okay. Um, is there any more questions? Okay. I will do the last one. Okay, mm -hmm. I know that it was not the topic of the presentation, but you mentioned that okay, the other, I don't know how to say, great, great crisis mm -hmm. of re, not reproducibility, but replica, replicability. Ah, yes, yes, yes. Okay, yeah. 
in to, talking about okay the scientific research you are okay from a statistic more from a statistical viewpoint you are finding intellectual research, uh, a lot of different resources that are very difficult for to replicate or to reproduce as well could you mention something about that or yes for for data collection you mean right yeah for yeah data, for data collection because there are a lot of okay as uh, sometimes we are i think you mentioned in the presentation sometimes the researchers are fishing for results okay they are okay accumulating data making a lot of statistical analysis in order to find a result and in order to publish but after that is very difficult okay you are publishing some research that is of low quality but you have okay you if you combine the pressure for publication with okay with some wrong methodologies okay we have just a okay a, a crisis just now okay in this other sense of not rep reproducibility but repli replicability okay mm -hmm. if you can mention about something about that yes um yeah for for day for so i'm on the you see my screen right i'm on the slide uh, to separate replicability yeah. from replicability yes so um uh, yeah in terms of replicability and how to collect data to be reproducible um this is really a very interesting thing and um it's it, it, well we in, in this aspect we can't have uh exact you see it can never be exactly reproduced because every time you're collecting new data you have noise you have different noise things uh, depending on the field of study and um, there are ways though so medicine in medicine they they put a lot of energy on this because in medicine uh, they usually don't have really complex uh, analysis but they have very complex uh, data acquisition steps yeah. so how how to prepare the cells that like in one um, laboratory is the same as another well statistically similar to another laboratory uh, so they, they've done a lot of work on this. When, when I was like generally reading about this and reading about replicability or the reproducible data collection, um, um, uh, they have, um, they, uh, in medicine they've done, I think they're the most advanced uh, in, in all fields compared to all fields. Um, because well, it's really important. It's about human life. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, uh, I guess they 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 have a lot of budgets and a lot of good. Um, 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 they've done a lot of good work on on how to make a, a data collection statistically reproducible. Okay. Okay. I have not any more questions. Okay. If there is not any more question, then. Okay, thank you, Mohamed. Okay. Thank you. Thank it was you very much. Um, I think it's so, so important this topic. Okay, I expect that in the future, okay, thank you. Thanks to your projects and to projects similar to the one yeah, to you are leading. We could do a research in which it will be easier for us to compare results, to replicate results, and to avoid all these problems that we are having just now with the reproducibility of the scientific resource. Yes, Thank you. that would be great. That would be great. I really look forward. Please get in touch if you're interested. Uh, I'd really like to help uh, new you know, researchers help adopt this. And uh, uh, yeah, maybe put a workshop later if enough people are interested. Just let me know. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Mohamed. <laughs>